Good evening, and welcome to the third session of Loretta House Alumni Association's online series of discussions. Uh, well, I have been entrusted with the task of introducing you to two personalities who need absolutely no introduction at all to any student of Loretta House, Mrs. Uma Ahmed and Mrs. Shirley Chinoy. What can I say about Mrs. Emma and Mrs. Chinoy that hasn't already been said before? That they were educators who were empathizers as well. They were teachers who not only taught academics, but taught countless students to dream. Beneath a sheet of steel, both were all heart, grace, and caring. They left an indelible imprint on their students and molded them to enrich the world. Personally, I have been fortunate enough to have been taught by both of them and can say without any hesitation, that was the best thing which could have happened to me in my years. In conversation with our two uh, mentors is our very own Oindrila Dutt, an ideator, debater, moderator, and director. She has directed Sonnet Lumiere's at heritage sites and written columns for mainline dailies. Oindrila curates events and is the director of Open Doors. Join us as we catch up with two of the most revered teachers Loretta House has been enriched by. Just a small request before the program begins. Please do remember to keep yourselves on mute all through the session. Thank you. Over to you, Odi. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much, Chandu. And uh, having done two sessions before this, of this Loretto online session, which is not just for Loretto House or even Loretto Girls, it's for everyone. This is something that is really special to me, this session today. I was not lucky enough to be taught by either Auntie Uma and Auntie Sh or Auntie Shani, and that's what I am going to call them because it'll be very difficult for me to say anything else. But they both call me their surrogate daughters, and that is very special for me. That's a special gift, and that is why this session is so special to me. I know there are people across the globe, students of theirs, students of Loretto, who've just seen them in school and been inspired by them. The way they talk, the way they conduct themselves, the way they teach, the way they taught, the way they empathize, the way they reached out to students to make their lives better, not just academically, but in every which way. And there are people across the globe who've called back and said they're so excited by this session. So let's start quickly. I'm going to start with Auntie Uma. Auntie Uma, you studied in Loreto for a brief period when you were very young. And then uh, with, with the onset of the Second World War, as far as I know, you moved to Lahore and then came back and went straight into college to do your inter-arts and uh, you, I think you did English and inter-arts or something like that. Now, tell us a bit about those early years, your experience of Loreto then as a student. Early years, uh, well, because that's the time of life when you're meeting new people. And yes, I was in Lahore, which was such a different place and so many different people. And the political situation had been very alarming in Lahore because they were on the verge of being divided uh, India. Yes. And we didn't know, we lived in Lahore. I was in a school called Sacred Heart. And uh, nobody knew, the nuns didn't knew, know if they'd be there. But uh, anyway, we got through all that and came back here and joined Loreto. I had always been in Loreto as a child. So I just walked in and funnily enough, Mother Superior was the same, Mother Concilio, and she knew me. And uh, so it was lovely rejoining and I joined from the college from the first year up to fourth year in those days, they used to have four years. And uh, then 
got a job, got married, and 13 years later did my BA because yes. mother insisted. There's an interesting story to that also, which we'll come back to later. How you did be it, how the nuns persuaded you. But yeah. I'm just going to go to Auntie Sherney and ask her about her school. Auntie Sherney, you were a boarder at a Cody school. And then you went to Bombay to do your, uh, I think you did English, did you? At St. Xavier's in Bombay. What was it like to be at a boarding school in Kodi, first of all? First of all, I must say I loved Kodi. I loved boarding school life and I was very happy there. It gave me my love for nature and I think it gave me a lot of independence of thought as well. And I was very happy with the nuns. So there was never a problem. And then you went to? It taught me how to walk. Because ah. for nine months of the year, from the time we went up to school from till November when we left, we never sat in a car. And I have to tell everyone Hello. that this teaching Hello. Auntie Sherney how to walk is probably what enabled her much later as a grandmother to walk to base camp, make it to base camp Everest when one of her very fit sons couldn't reach there. She was a grandmother and she made it to base camp. So yes, you learned how to walk. And then you went to St. Xavier's and? Over there I took history, French and political science. I was lucky to get a, an honors degree in these three subjects. But later on, I went back to my first love, which was geography. Geography. And that's what people remember you for and also world history because that was something that you taught brilliantly. Okay, I'm going to yeah, ask you- It's a great combination. Auntie Shani, I think you need to be a little louder. Malika? Okay, I'm going to go back to Auntie Uma. Thanks, you're freezing a little. I'm? Freezing a little. Okay, so is uh, Auntie Shani. Okay, yeah. hopefully that won't uh, happen. Yeah, so, okay. Auntie Uma, let's go back to that B. Ed. story. You had children in school, so you would take them, you would pick them up, and the nuns were at you, that you have to do your B. Ed. and you have to teach. And you kept saying that, no, I can't. I have children to look after. And one fine day, you were just informed by one of our dear nuns that we've registered you and you're doing your B. Ed. Is that how it happened? Yes, it did. That's how it happened. The nuns and I had become friendly by then. And she said, I've just put your name down now and you join on such and such date. And I did. And funnily enough, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed that. Uh, those days, it was only a year. I really enjoyed doing my BA. And before my exam results came out, I was already teaching in Loreto House. And uh, it was great fun. I've never stopped. I mean, now I've stopped. Now I'm very old. But uh, still, it was lovely there. All the teachers were. And the funny part is that even Shani and I, Shani came much later. She's far younger than me. But both of us, we were, we had a social group of parents who were friends. So we used to I meet the parents practically and uh, the children every day practically. So it was very nice having, uh, of course, the parents would surround you, how is my daughter, this, that, and the other, but it all worked out very well. I was just no. going to say very nice for you and the parents, probably not for the poor children. But... No, but it, it was very convenient because there are things that the children did and you realized it was because of something going on in the home. Yeah. You know, you were able to sympathize. You were able to give a little bit of advice and just keep them cheerful. So uh, that was very nice. In fact, uh, I'm not going to mention names, but there was a friend of Auntie Uma's and Uncle Mumtaz's who would spoil his youngest daughter, Silly, help her to bunk school and the like. 
And Auntie Uma called him one day and really read him the riot act and said, you stop doing this. Do you know you're ruining her life? So being friends didn't stop her from doing that. As I wrote, that steel exterior. Okay, Auntie Sherni, what made you think that you wanted to teach? Why? I always wanted to teach, but there was not the right time. Because after marriage, and I got married young, we had three children. We'll ask about that. But when we came, yes. And when we came back, I applied to Loretto House, where Sister Mary took my interview. I don't know what she saw in me, but I was very lucky to be accepted. I had been away from academics for 12 years. So it was really difficult. I still remember an occasion during some psychology class, I think, when they talked about the plateaus and the peaks of learning. And I had to stand up and say, plateaus and peaks are for other people. I only have valleys <laughs> because <laughs> learning again was really very difficult. And in the evening, the three children and I would sit down together and do our homework. So that was my first experience of coming to BN. Later on, I found that where I did my practice teaching, the teacher, uh, well, her husband got transferred. So I was asked to step in and I've been at Loretto House ever since, to my good fortune. Both of you never changed. Today, teachers, even though they have a very strong relationship with their schools, they change. But both of you spent your professional lives as teachers at Loretto. Were you really happy there? Did you ever think of changing? Or could you not think of ever changing and going to another school? Aunt you Uma? Asking? You, you. Me? I yeah. asked that oh. I, but you never changed from the. No, I got lovely job offers from this American school who oh. gave you such a hefty salary. And I came and asked Mother Patricia, she was the principal. I'm getting this salary, mother. Do I think, do you think I should take the job? She said, yes, during the holidays. <laughs> she refused to let me go. So I was uh, very And devoted. you probably didn't really want to. Otherwise, yes. you would have tried. Not really Ati, want to, but I was very you? tempted. A, the school was next door to me on D Road. Uh, just get out of my gate and into their gate. And they had thousands in salary and this and that. Anyway, never went around there. So, Auntie so Shani, the same for you. You never thought of changing. No. If I, changed, if I left the retro, it would be leaving the children I loved. Ah. And I didn't want to do that. I, I can understand yes. because Auntie Shani's students, one of them being Urunduti, Buru, who was meant to be here with us on this program, says that there was no one who understood her grief when she lost a pet the way Auntie Shani did. She says that really she made my life so much better. She empathized. She was on the same level. She took away my grief and made me smile again. So there are people who do that. Anki, you said that I made their lives better. Have you ever thought of how much they made my life better? Yes. Lots and lots. Really? I, know. I know. Okay, I'm going to ask both of you now about, you had very supportive partners, both of you. How did you meet Uncle Mumtaz, Auntie Uma? And how was he about you teaching in Loreto? Because initially, when the nuns would tell you, you didn't want to. You said that I have uh, a children at home. I can't do this. So how was he uh, about your teaching? Was he completely supportive? And uh, how did you meet him? How did you come to be with Uncle Mukhtas? Well, it did. And it's so long ago. But I don't remember. No, 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 no. You remember. Difficulty at all. 
And Mumtaz became so friendly with all the nuns. He used to yeah. admire their eyes and used to say, how did you become a nun? And he became one of yeah. their friends. That uh, they themselves were very fond of him also. So he never objected. And uh, it was so convenient and so easy. Three of us would go, my two daughters and I would go and come back together. And uh, one of my daughters needed my help. The other one was Anjobu. Everybody knows that it didn't need any help. But it was great. It was lovely during that uh, period because it didn't interfere with my home life at all. Okay. Auntie Shani, how about you? How did you meet... Uh... Uncle Mickey came and decided to settle down in Calcutta because you weren't from Calcutta. No, we're from Bombay. Yeah. And as I still call it Bombay, not Mumbai. Thank God. My husband had always been with a tea company and headquarters have to be Calcutta. So that's how we came to Calcutta. And that's when I started thinking of something to do. Because all I was doing as a housewife was becoming a vegetable. And not just a vegetable, a cabbage. I was so proud. It was coming to be it that really helped. And in that one year, Oinki, I must have worked so hard that I lost 30 pounds. Oh. That really oh. Okay. So okay. I feel, I feel uh, now see, I can di digress a little from Loretto. You were a Hindu, married to Uncle Mumtaz. You met him and it was a love marriage. And uh, you're one of the few mixed marriages I've seen where you were not even asked to change your religion and you both kept your religious practices. But in that day and age, it must have been difficult. So tell us a bit about what kind of reactions you came up against what happened and how did you deal with it? Was it really because of Uncle Mumtaz's support? Yeah. Uh, no, there was a, a very mixed reaction. My father loved Mumtaz. So he was very, well. my mother also liked him, but she was a very Hindu, Hindu lady. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, how will you do this? How will you do that? And uh, I remember Mumtaz going to her and saying, oh, I'll convert to Hinduism. And she said, nobody can convert to Hinduism. You have to be born to a caste. And this and that, you know? So there was great tamasha going on all the time. And for two years, I'm afraid we weren't allowed to get married. Then eventually it worked out. And uh, I hadn't seen Mumtaz for about eight months. And... Uh, I'm afraid I was on the verge of getting TB because I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, I was in a very bad way. And my mother finally actually rang Mumtaz and said, come. So then it took off from there. It was a bad period, but there was happiness. To it worked out brilliantly. Yeah. He was very and I still nice. remember, that's something that is so special, one of the memories for me is that you were both so supporting about each other's religions and festivities. When I was in advertising, Auntie Uma requested me to get a calligraphic thing done, which is from the Quran. And that was a gift to Uncle Mumtaz. And Auntie Shani is not quite that different, but she did have a Parsi grandmother. So she's seen the difficulties of mixed marriages. And Parsi mother as well. Yes. But it was a mixed marriage. Religion was not really discussed at home. I went to a Catholic school. And so there was so much toleration all over. There was never a question, especially in those days of religious differences or communal differences. Yeah. That okay. uh, both of you, Auntie Shani, Auntie Uma, if, when you've seen Loretto then, and you've had a pretty long inning, so you've taught for a long time. What are the differences you see in the Loretto of today? 
you've ha both had grandchildren in Loreto, Dia and uh, I, uh, I don't think Sharmin, but Alia went to Loreto. So yes. what are the differences you saw in Loreto? Who are you I, asking? You, you, both me. of you. Yes. You. Yes, well, no, How do you uh, think it has changed? For the better? For the worse? What could be different? No, it, uh, Loreto in my time, right. don't forget I'm way back. Right. Loreto in my time was a very strict sort of place, but we expected it at that time. Right. And I'm very happy to right. say that they kept up with the way other people live even now. And they are not as... Uh, you know, a convent is a convent. There were so many things you were not allowed to do and so forth. But now they have kept up and the girls who come out are well adjusted to their society. And yeah. that's yeah. really what the school has to give. Any school should be giving. They should be well adjusted to the people they're living with, useful citizens, and uh, not just partying all the time. And this is what we were taught in Doretto, always to look after the poorer people as well. So that I, I'm very uh, grateful that I was able to spend that much time there. And oh. even after I finished, I'm still there. <laughs> so, so uh, Auntie Shani, I'm I have you. Sorry, you how do you think Loreto has changed? Do you like the way it's changed? Did you like the old Loreto? Do you think Loreto now can do something different? I don't know whether it can do much different because it still teaches the same values. Yeah. And it is the values. And the, you know, the way a Loreto girl will, will just, her deportment, the way she goes about things, yeah. you can tell instinctively that where she was educated. And I'm still so proud of that. Wonderful. So, really, there isn't that much difference. Times might change. Children might change. Parents also might change. But the values don't. I know. That is, I think, the core belief in yeah. Loreto. And I'm also very, very proud of the way that Loreto celebrated every religious function, uh, festival. But whichever religion it was, it was celebrated with equal zest. Yes, yes. Okay, <clears throat> Auntie Shani, let me ask you this. Other than teaching, you were very interested in swimming. Uh, you had physical activities, a passion for physical activity, swimming, walking, trekking, traveling the world. And do you think that's helped you as you go into an older age of retirement to deal with life now? <laughs> okay, I must tell you, most of the adventurous things I've done have been only after I became a grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> so that was not to stop yes. me. And I thank you for that. Okay. But, well, she swims, how much is it? How many laps? Not so many anymore. So that's but okay. you used to swim at least 50 laps, I think. At least. Not yes. so long ago. That's amazing. And uh, Auntie Uma, you were interested in art always. You had an artistic streak in you. And I know that you've done a course in, I think, Japanese, uh, a Japanese style of painting where you don't draw outlines. You just uh, paint, brush, paint. And all that you do now, recently you haven't been doing it. All the beautiful kurta pieces, the table linen, the saris, that's the style you follow. So tell us a bit about your art. How did you get interested in art? What did you do with it? Never learned formally how to draw or paint. I, whenever I had a chance to do so, something else happened and I had to give it up. Mm. But when I was visiting my uh, sister-in-law once in uh, Malaysia, 
and she had joined a class for painting and so on what they call uh, you know it's sketching more than anything and I went around with her and my interest was again aroused and I came home and did a whole lot of painting uh, based on what I had learned for two weeks that was a two-week course only and uh, it was very uh, satisfying for me and I went through a period where I painted a lot but uh, now I'm not painting that much but still all my birthday presents are hand-painted presents for somebody yes. else to yes. give to each other that's it I've never made it a business it's never been a business I've never charged for anything I know you used to do a showroom, a paint company showroom. There's show windows somewhere off uh, Kamak Street or Lower Circular Road. Am I yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So that was something that was regular. That Sorry? was something. Uh, the oh, paint yes, company yes. showroom. That yes, was something a, that was for a short while. It was very yeah. regular, not short, quite long, yeah. but uh, that that is over now. Now, I but what is amazing is that Auntie Uma would design the showroom and fabricate each piece herself. The cardboard stuff, the cutouts, everything was fabricated by you. Am I right? Yes, I did. Yeah, and did. Uh, I felt that when you work with your hands, the little children work with their hands and put their thoughts into what they want to do. They are learning self-communication, independence of mind, creativity. And uh, sometimes you don't have this and you use that instead. So inventiveness. So it is, uh, I find a very, very essential thing for craft to be part of the especially early teaching stage. Okay. Uh, Auntie Sherni, you learned riding at a much older age. You asked one of your students who was feeling sad about losing a pet who used to go riding, that can I come riding with you probably to make her feel better and spend time with her. Now, that's not easy to learn riding much later on in life. What made you do it? Did you, did you enjoy it? How long did I you ride? It, Frankie, I loved it. It's something that had been put on the back burner. Yeah. And then I just had to do it. It was like trekking or anything that I wanted to do. I suddenly realized I wasn't getting any younger. So I might as well go ahead and do it. But that was yes. it. And riding, because I love horses, mm -hmm. was a great pleasure. It brought me really a lot of happiness. I know. Auntie Uma, I'm going to ask you a bit more about your art. You also, while you were in college, you had, uh, you were with a design, you were with a company designing something with them. What was with it? With the, uh, yes, I always was a part of. Uh, and your mother didn't like it. Craft. She said, how yes. can you work for a yes. company? That so, came very automatically. I've never had a formal teaching uh, oh. this thing with art and craft. But whatever I wanted to, if I'm teaching history, I'd be doing some sort of sketching on the board. If I'm teaching geography, I'd be doing maps and things on the board. I was always using chalk and board and, you know, illustrating. So uh, that's it. That's how my, uh, that's how I use my art and craft uh, ability, whatever I had in uh, my teaching. So... Okay. It, it seemed to, children like to see something apart from just the printed page. And they understood things when they, you know, I don't know what example to give you. But if I wanted to say, tell them of how, um, how maybe somebody from India had to go to Australia or something, I would draw the places on the map and show, show them how difficult it had been in those days, no transport, nothing but your own two legs or a horse or something. And uh, it would make the children sit up a bit and make them feel that, my goodness, you know, what a accomplishment that was. So I like to illustrate what I'm teaching. 
that's uh, if that answers time, your right? question yes it does it does and i think you yeah. also illustrated for eve's weekly if i'm not mistaken you did fashion for pages. a while yes yeah, yes you did that okay but there was an occasion in loreto house when mother superior came and said that we will not be able to redo the painting in the classrooms this year because we have spent all our money in changing from ac to dc some wiring or something so i said can i paint the wall and she looked at me and she said all right and i painted with the class the whole wall uh, history syllabus and she interrupted every lesson of mine bringing people from different schools <laughs> to show them this wall it was 3 years on the wall till it started flaking off it was only poster colors okay. so that was a great um, fun that i had and the children had that was lovely auntie uma i'm going to pick up on your travel bit history lessons and showing them australia maybe and how people went there now auntie shani is an absolutely die hard passionate traveler she's yes. loved traveling and she is one of the few brave grandparents who has done trips sort of educational in nature but sometimes just adventure trips or something that will make her children uh, grandchildren happy all four of them or just two of them so auntie shani tell us about your fantastic travel trips which what were the highlights of this travel which ones i must and i hope say, you put ladakh in there as well i must say i love being a grandmother and i really enjoyed their company and i especially enjoyed their company when there were no parents around so the four of them and i used to travel every year usually during the easter holidays perhaps to yes. singapore perhaps to malaysia perhaps to thailand you got to eat in the far east or the near east whatever you want to call it because yes. it was much easier at that time than going west but we have been my two granddaughters and i drifting down the nile while the two yes. of them pretended they were contemporary cleopatras mm -hmm. and i did take the two grandsons to the states at one time there was this horrible business of public exams mm -hmm. so, so we couldn't all travel together mm -hmm. those who were the two that were doing exams had to stay behind and go the following year but yeah. Yeah. it was a great experience for me it was really selfishness on my part i hope they enjoyed it i think they loved it and so did the parents and i have to tell you about ladakh because uh, i was I going to ladakh happy memories of the time we spent together i know but i have to tell them how it came about we were sitting and discussing a ladakh trip that i was doing and uncle mickey sprang up and he said with such earnestness Anki, please take her, please. Otherwise, she'll drag me to Ladakh someday. So that's how Auntie <laughs> Shani came to Ladakh, and we had the most fabulous time. Really, she was such a sporting traveler, more energy than most of us who were younger than her. It was wonderful, and uh, I wanted to know: you've had children and grandchildren in school. Hopefully, by the time the grandchildren were there. they weren't too troubled by your presence but the children certainly one that i know of had a traumatic time because there were all these people complaining to the mother in the teacher's room so aunty shan uh, aunty shani i'll come to you later aunty uma who was the daughter who gave you more trouble by being in school a student who did you get complaints about more Oh, uh, the my younger one, Aisha, poor thing, was not a good student at all. She was great fun, but she was not. And Anjumin, the older one, was coming first in everything, left, right, and center. So she was no problem. Yeah. But yeah. poor Aisha, I felt so bad for her because she was being compared by every teacher with her older sister, and I thought that was very unfair. and they come to be look at anju she did this she did this what is aisha doing she is not doing it. and i didn't like that sort of thing yeah. but anyway it happened 
with Samira, it was a little different. Anyway, they went and complained about her. So much so that she wanted to change and she did change. Class 11 and 10, she did in La Martinia. Not that she wanted to go there, but she just wanted to escape the mother. <laughs> Auntie Shani is not looking happy, but that's how it was. Okay. I wanted to know, give us some of your memories, Auntie Shani, some of your favorite students. Right. Also, I won't use that word. Some of the students that you had really wonderful times with or shared lovely experiences with, or even some of the really naughty ones. Oh, you know, that would take at least an hour. So could we some. have a separate Zoom meeting on that? <laughs> some, some. And just so. <laughs> One thing I learned to really admire was the courage shown by the children. Yeah. I still remember we were doing a war story called Caught in the Crossfire. And mm. I told them, you know, crossfires can be verbal as well. Have mm. you ever been caught in one? And the stories I heard about their home life oh. being caught in the crossfire between parents. Luckily, it was a double period and we could talk about that. And I find that I don't know if the children remember to teach a particular subject, but I mm. think a lot of my teaching has been based on personal relationships and so much on affection and respect. Yes. And I don't mean their respect. I mean my respect for them as people. And I really, really miss that after I left her. I miss the children. I, I can imagine because the last session we had was with Priya, Priya Paul and Shonali Bose. And I remember Shonali mentioning you over and over again and talking about you and what an impact you'd made on her life, you'd had on her life. So I can well believe that. And there are other teachers who've talked about the empathy and understanding you've shown when they've been through a tough time, how you've tried to get into their shoes and understand things from their point of view. Auntie Uma, I've heard the same things about you. So tell us some of your favorite stories about school. About school? Yes. Uh, yes. It's very hard to suddenly think of. I've had a wonderful time in school all the days. So, uh, who troubled you? Did anyone trouble you? Others. Did Pardon? any student really trouble you? No names, but are there no. any? Actually, their parents were good friends and they used to sit and tell me things and I'd be able to somehow help the child. But uh, no children, I cannot remember anybody being in such trouble that I should recall. They did come and confide in me. My mom won't let me do this. Papa won't let me do this. And I want to go out. I want to meet boys. All that sort of thing used to go on. And I had children about the same age. So it was yeah. a sort of a session, you know. So I can't say that I was very uh, uh, involved with all that as much as just friendship with the children. I've never uh, been teacherish, you know, mm -hmm. just being friends with them. And uh, perhaps that's why they came to me and that's why they uh, tried to, you know, remain friends even afterwards. Yeah. Now I hear from so many and I yeah. can't even recall their faces, but I seem to remember where they sat. <laughs> it was near the window, under the, the whatever it is. That, like, that, I'm everyone that. has an abiding memory of Auntie Uma with that flower in her yes, hand yes. and the bunch of keys. Didn't you have a bunch of keys tucked yes. into your sari? Yes. And she wore that crisp is. white saris. But that keys That's thing is a story. My husband was in dude school and the master they loved used to make a clumping noise when he came down the corridor so that all the class could settle down. And there was another teacher who wore kids. He'd sneak into the class and everybody was standing and talking and they'd get their green card or whatever the card they were given. So I heard this story. 
So I would, my keys, I jangled them. <laughs> when I came okay. down, I jangled them to let everyone know the teacher's on her way. So that's one of the reasons that uh, I've had that big bunch of keys yeah. also. Auntie Shani. I interrupted this point. At Sorry? one time, yeah. Yeah. our principal said, you know, in a staff meeting, mention any teacher who's made an impact on you. And yeah. I was the first person to speak. And I chose Auntie Uma because Uma has always given us something to live up to in every single way. How lovely and I that said is. even then, a very hard act to follow. Yeah. And I must really thank you for your example, Uma. Mm. That's lovely. And Auntie Shani, I wanted to ask you, who are some of the other teachers who made a mark? I know you were very close to Mrs. Levy and you were so good to her when she was older. And there's a lovely story, true story, by the way. I was not in Mrs. Levy's section and I was so happy. I, I think I was in Mrs. Wellchamber's section because everyone was terrified of Mrs. Levy. And uh, one student came in late one day and she turned around and said, why are you late? So the father who was still there said, no, no, I, I'm responsible. She's late because of me. She said, into the dustbin, stand there. And the whole class collapsed because that father actually went and stood in the dustbin. He was punished <laughs> for 10 minutes. Yeah. So, so are there any other teachers that you have really interesting memories about, Auntie Shani? I was very happy to have class six, seven, and eight in one smooth line with Uma, myself in seven, Uma in six, myself in seven, and Rita Chakrabarti in eight. Okay. Because we had the same feeling, the same attitude towards the children. So for them, it was an extremely smooth transition. And middle school for them, was a good, safe place to be, a good okay. learning experience, and yeah. a sense of security. Wonderful. That somebody would understand them and somebody would care. Here, I think caring is one oh. of the most important things when it comes to teaching. Yeah. When it came to the children, I learned a lot about them from the essays and letters I had asked them to write. The first one was all about me. And there was another lovely one. Like, write a letter you would like to receive. And so many girls got scholarships or were asked to join the film or proposed to my leading movie actor. And then secret ambition you'd be surprised how many girls wanted to kill their brothers. <laughs> really. <laughs> and I remember also one, write a letter to your parents or a guardian on receiving a bad letter, a bad drug from school. Um, I'll hit you to get a birthday party. Your father was so clever, your little brother. Only one parent I remember out of those 45 said, did you not understand or did you not study? Uh, okay. So okay. that was a learning experience for me. Yeah. So there are so many memories that way when it comes to understanding the children. I wanted to ask, we're almost nearing uh, the close of the session. I wanted to ask you, Auntie Uma and Auntie Shani, uh, you seem to have so much closeness with the children. Yet, it wasn't very important those days to talk about what is happening at home, what is politically correct, how people should behave. It just didn't seem necessary. Yet, there was a closeness. They could come to you. They did come to you you try to understand completely. It's much more cut and dried now. You are supposed to tell them 
nobody has a right to do this to you. These are some things that you have the right to expect. Do you think it's better now? Or do you think it works? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, I, uh, I am a little out of touch now, but uh, what you're talking of in our days, you see, it's a circumstance. Two of my children were in the school and they were friends with the, the other students, including mm -hmm. my own. Yeah. Parents we knew very well. We kept meeting them socially also. So it was like a family. And we knew each other's problems. We knew each other's um, whatever was going on. So it wasn't just a ma'am situation at all. As a matter of fact, so many children in the class would say auntie to me, you know, because uh, that's how they saw me. Yeah. So yeah. it was very comfortable that I knew the parents and knew the surroundings and the household and so on. So I wasn't, I cannot remember mm. ever being asked to, you know, solve some problem or the other. They were discussed and we all discussed them together. Then they came to their own conclusions. But I can't, I never have tried to advise them do this or do that because it may not be the right thing. I'm, I'm not a know-all. So it was in a very casual and friendly atmosphere all around. That's, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, right? well, yes, it does. And Auntie Shani, I wanted to come to you with this and also mention that I believe you had a great sense of humor. Uh, once a class, your class probably, was being fired by somebody else for doing something naughty. And Auntie Shani came in and asked, what is it? What has happened? Why are they being scolded? And she crack, cracked up laughing when she heard what they were being fired for. So, and yet she could also walk in and put her foot down and really shout that what the, whatever is going on, what are you up to? So tell us a bit about it. How did humor help you to deal with situations? Of course, humor helps you. It prevents you from becoming a bully. Yeah. You know, if you talk to children and smile with them or laugh with them, they are more inclined to look to listen to you. Yes. Yes. If you lay down the law, Anki, I have never believed when children are concerned that if you're good, you'll be happy. Mm. I've always believed it's the other way around. If you're happy, you'll be good. Good. Yes. And that's, that's what wonderful. Try to achieve. Yeah. In personal relationships with the children and in academics. Yeah. And there wasn't that kind of pressure then. I think that made a difference. You have to perform, you have to get a certain percentage of marks to make a life for yourself to make the cut. And that I think was one of the nice things that you still had so much time to do things that you enjoyed other than academics. But, but when we were in middle school, Uba and I, where there yeah. wasn't that much pressure. Ah. That's what I mean. Overall, there wasn't, I think, Auntie Shani. But I'm going to just quickly ask, are there any questions? Uh, Shaman Noy? There is none on Facebook. Okay. Uh, maybe we should have uh, asked uh, people to tune in for questions. But before we end, we'll just see if a question or two comes in now. Uh, I think... The other great system, I mean, things changed over the years, but there was a lot of democracy in Loreto. I remember when we became captains, it wasn't the teachers choosing the captains. It was the students who voted for the captains. So what democracy was about was taught to us at an early age. And I think that's where those values that you talked about arose from that you had to earn the position you got, earn the respect you thought you deserved. It's changed now, maybe because that's how it is everywhere. But I think it was a nice system that we had in school. And one thing that stays in my mind, which you all talked about, 
was the very inclusive, respectful, integrated system that we had, which is wonderful because it was a Catholic school, but we were taught from every scripture, we were taught to respect each other, and we did. And the nicest thing was that we were not aware of social distinctions and differences. I think that is something that I wish wasn't there today. We didn't even know what religion the next person belonged to. It didn't really matter to us. I'm going to bring this to a close. And I just want to say a personal note that they made so many children, Uma Ahmed and Shani Chinoy, so many students that they taught. They made so many of them feel almost always that these were surrogate mothers. They were the wind beneath their wings. They could be confided in. They could be trusted to give advice, the right kind, to discipline them, yes, to scold them, but to give them the understanding that a child deserves. And I just want to end with one rather amusing story here. Auntie Uma, as I said, both of them call me their surrogate daughter. And I always tell their children that I'm the preferred one. So once we were sitting, Auntie Uma's elder daughter, Anjum, I, and a few others, and one of them is also somebody she treats like a daughter. So she said, no, no, Beta, you know, you're like my daughter. You're all of you like my daughters. And Anjum reacted furiously, said, excuse me, mommy, I am your daughter. I'm not like your daughter. So that is the very difference, the level of difference that some people think there is. But obviously, these two ladies don't see that difference, not with me, not with so many students. Thank you for being a part of our lives. Thank you for making Loretto a large part of what it was. Thank you for making such a difference in so many lives, making their lives better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to Libby. Uh, yes. You. Um, well, I just want to say one thing. Thank you very much, Malika and Shanali and Wendy, I think, for helping. Thank you so much. So what can be, be said about Auntie Uma and Mrs. Chinoy? I mean, as Oinki said, there's very little you can say because everybody knows it all. Lippi, but could we have you on screen? Yeah, you can. Oh, I'm on screen. Um, but it is uh, amazing how they were way ahead of their time because yeah. it was so many years ago that uh, they taught and they um, sort of drilled into the uh, uh, girls who later on became successful women that you have to make a difference in life. You have to stand up and be counted. Yeah. So they are really institutions. And uh, we are all better for having associated with them. And uh, so thank you very much, Auntie and uh, Mrs. Chinoy. And Anki, thank you very much for moderating as beautifully as ever. This and, was a pleasure uh, for me, Lippi. Really, yeah, it was. And, uh, thank you, Shaman Noy, for doing the back end. And uh, we hope to have more of these sessions soon. Thank you. Thank you all. And this will be uploaded on YouTube soon. Thank you, Aiki. Thank you, Auntie Shani.